Hello and welcome to this manufacturing process technology part 2 module 34. We were talking about the tool electrode uh, material selection and also the dielectric material in an EDM process. So, the first uh, thing which uh, needs to be ascertained is that what kind of electrode materials are uh, to be chosen for a successful EDM metal machining to happen and uh, most commonly used electrode materials are brass copper graphite aluminum alloys copper uh, tungsten alloys silver tungsten alloys etc and the method for making the electrodes are uh, either conventional machining that is something that one can think of directly and uh, you know these are particularly used for copper brass copper tungsten alloys easy to machine materials you know even silver or maybe tungsten alloys aluminum alloys etc. Graphite is not that easy to machine and so therefore, there is some other method that can be uh, deployed for uh, depositing graphite on the surface of any other uh, you know uh, material which would give enough strength for sustaining the, um, the, uh, the vibrations etc. that are being imposed <laughs> by the spark uh, generation process alone. Uh, there is a uh, metal spraying and press forming which are some of the other processes which are utilized for making tool materials or electrode materials. Uh, you also need to produce flow holes. So, they are provided normally for better circulation of the dielectric and these holes should be as large as possible for uh, rough cuts to allow large flow rates at a low pressure. Uh, regarding dielectric fluids, uh, the basic requirement of an ideal dielectric fluids are really that it should be low viscosity, there should not be any um, you know uh, surface forces of uh, drag which would come out which may change the orientation of the tools particularly in thin tools. There should be absence of toxic vapors. Uh, by and large the dielectric fluid should be chosen in a manner so that they are chemical, ne chemical neutral, they are not able to react to any other part of the, uh, the supports or the tool holders and etcetera. There should be generally a low or almost negligible inflaming tendency. So, that is one important point because there are sparks which are generated and although they are very momentary, if the uh, ignition point is very low, there is a tendency of the whole thing to get uh, inflamed and that should not happen. Okay. And um, then obviously, low cost again is a important criteria. So, there are many uh, electro the dielectrics which are normally used like kerosene, paraffin oil, you know silicone oil etcetera. These are all hydrocarbon based materials which are preferable for this purpose and uh, or you know the, the basic dielectric can also start from an ordinary water uh, which possesses almost all these properties. Only thing is that in case of water particularly when you are machining steel there is an additional problem of rusting which may come out and it may not be a very good choice. So, that is why one shifts to hydrocarbon oils rather than water. So, uh, there is another uh, issue about water that there is always a potential difference between the uh, tool and the workpiece, you know, any DM. And so, obviously, it is uh, uh, all about how much what is the conductivity level of the water if we are using plain water samples. If the conductivity of water is higher, then there is always a tendency that there would be an electrochemical machining process which would start happening. And this may lead to some kind of a tool distortion or the workpiece distortion which is highly undesirable as far as the EDM process goes actually. So, therefore, it is preferable always to get this uh, hydrocarbon based uh, EDM material as a dielectric fluid. Let us just look at another aspect before we close the EDM topic and that is about the, uh, the effects of EDM on metal surfaces, particularly the hardness and how uh, that gets affected because of the machining process. So, whether it is mechanical machining or any other kind of machining, there is always a tendency to uh, have uh, a super hardened region, you know, which is because of uh, because of strain hardening on the surface of the material, because uh, it is a peeling process in conventional machining that we are looking at. EDM also, because uh, there is a tendency of uh, the material to uh, be melted and redeposited, and there is always a hardness issue which would come up. And uh, we need to look at it in more details as to how the hardness changes because of such spark machining uh, and high temperatures. So, the high temperatures generated by the sparks causes uh, melting and vaporization as you know. Uh, 
and uh, melting and vitrization of the metal and also the resolidification would uh, definitely affect the properties of uh, the materials which are close to the surface maybe we can call them the shallow layers okay of the machine surface so outermost uh, layer is obviously rapidly chilled and so uh, it would be definitely very very hard because of the quick annealing uh, and uh, because of this quick chilling action there is always a tendency of this material to be very very hard if you may remember the time tran temperature transformation ttt curves as illustrated in part 1 of this course uh, we had mentioned there the quick formation of the martensite state which results in hardening so we are also machining steels here so obviously this uh, uh, rapid chilling or you know uh, rapid cooling would result in this kind of hardness Obviously, there is going to be a layer below this hard layer which is somewhat uh, tempered in its condition and if I look at the, the profile of a uh, you know in case of a roughing EDM operation and by roughing we mean a very high spark energy, uh, we can see that the hardness suddenly uh, you know if we, if we look at it as a function of depth. So, on the surface the hardness is pretty good pretty high it is in the range of about 60 Rockwell hardness uh, 60 HRC and uh, it goes down all the way to about 100 and you know at, at, at a depth of below about 125 microns on the surface where the hardness really is an all time low uh, which is uh, probably about 25 uh, HRC. So, from 60 to 25 HRC and uh, this, uh, this could be uh, actually as a result of the fact that you know just uh, adjoint to the, the rapid chilled layer is a layer which is also supplying the, uh, the amount of carbon uh, which could really lead to uh, a martensitic state formation on the top layer. So, this is a lot of a buffer layer you could say you know where uh, there is uh, it is it's a carbon provider for martensite to get generated on the, on the top layer. And then uh, obviously, as you increase further uh, these, these layers are more or less in a tempered condition the roughness just gradually changes you know up till it uh, goes to almost a stability of near about 30 to 32 uh, Rockwell hardness. So, the work material normally would have uh, hardness of about 31 to 36 and so uh, the remaining area is really not very important to be considered, but the sudden down uh, grading of the hardness uh, of, of a layer which has a complete martensite state and a layer which is like a supply layer for the excess carbon to for the martensite to happen. Okay. Uh, these are the two important states which need uh, some discussion. For a finishing process because the spark energy already is very low um, you know uh, the, it, is, it is clear that such hardening is not uh, a prominent, prominent feature because uh, we are not really superheating or anything uh, the material it is only just a few atomic layers that we are trying to move out by, by such processes. And so uh, therefore, the outer layer uh, in this case is tempered and the hardness is uh, low. Okay. And uh, in this case the uh, beyond a few layers of the, of the top the shallow layers below the top surface are really tempered and the hardness is low. So, the hardening of the surface layer during the EDM operation obviously would impart a better uh, wear resistance as far as the roughing process goes and because the hardness changes. However, uh, the overall fatigue strength would reduce due to micro cracks and that develops uh, during a rapid chilling process almost always uh, whether it is a casting process or it is you know some kind of a heat treatment of the cast or a forged material part etcetera that we had discussed about earlier in, in the material properties section. So, with this I would like to close on the EDM topic and start a new machining topic uh, uh, which is about e-beam machining. E-beam machining is again uh, uh, e deploying electrons or fast moving electrons, but the process of uh, the spark machining has been electron sudden release uh, because of a change in potential and also the dielectric breakdown. In this particular case in e-beam e -beam process it is a continuous source which emanates electrons at high velocity and these electrons uh, uh, make a momentum transfer at the surface where they are hitting which would result in a bond vibration or a change in uh, the overall temperature of the surface where the electrons hit. So, let us talk about this process in, in some details e-beam machining. So, 
it is obviously another thermal process where the agent which is uh, doing the heat transfer here is the electron beam. Uh, there is a stream of electrons in fact of high speed which impinge on the work surface and uh, transfer all their kinetic energy to the work material and this produces intense heating and sometimes melting or sometimes even vaporization. So, obviously depending on the intensity of the heat generated uh, the material either can melt or vaporize. In this case the intensity also goes to an extent where some of the material can actually get vaporized. Uh, <coughs> so, sublimates directly. The process of heating uh, by an electron beam uh, can generally depend on the intensity of the beam okay. and it can be used for various operations for example, annealing of the work surface, welding of two different parts together or even metal removal operations and in fact, nowadays E beam uh, with the softer energy is also used for doing a lot of uh, resist processing at a nan micro nano scale. In fact, if you may remember during the first section of this particular manufacturing process technology, we took you across process of um, you know, E beam lithography which is also known as the nano imprint lithography uh, and also nano imprint lithography which uh, engaged in fact the E beam based photo resist processing. So, very high velocities uh, can be obtained if you use uh, higher voltages for example, an accelerating voltage for the electron beam of about 150 kV uh, would produce electron velocities which are almost near the speed of light about 228,478 uh, kilometers per second. Uh, since an electron beam can be focused to a point uh, by magnetic fields almost as narrow as 10 to 200 nano micrometers and in fact, this uh, limit has gone down further these days. Uh, the power density of that particular point can go up almost to the level of about 6500 billion watts per millimeter square. So, such a power density obviously can vaporize any substance which uh, comes in contact with it immediately. In fact, what happens in E-beam is that when the high velocity electrons are uh, being moved to a surface, there are few surface layers which do not even uh, register that there is uh, fast moving electrons coming and in fact, the machining process starts at beyond certain surface layers. It starts from a certain depth uh, where uh, the, the momentum is being felt and the impact is being registered as a bond vibration or a uh, increase in kinetic energy. So, uh, E-beam is therefore, nothing but a precisely controlled vaporization process. Uh, in which the material can evaporate uh, real quick. Let us look at some of these uh, different processes around the hot spot diameter that they may generate and the power density that we are talking about. So, we can think of electro electric discharge in the very left corner of this particular plot here. The hot spot diameters are typically in the range of about uh, 10 microns and uh, the power density goes as high as about 10 to the power of 7 watt per millimeter square. Uh, the lasers again uh, would give a hot spot of between 10 and 100 uh, micrometers, high hot spot side is more and power density is slightly lower. It is probably in the range of somewhere around 10 to the power of 5 to 10 to the power of 7 uh, watt per millimeter square. There is also another process of uh, let us say welding arc or you know gas flame which generates really a high hot spot size it could go about 10, 10 to the power about 5 almost close to 10 to the power of 5 uh, micrometers about 0 0.1 uh, meter uh, and uh, it, it can have very very less uh, power density in the range of about 1 to uh, probably 10 or 15 watt per millimeter square. Similarly, in case of welding the hot spot is slightly lower. Uh, may be 10 to the power 3 to 10 to the power 4 microns, but the power density is slightly higher which is in the range of about close to uh, you know about 90 to about 10 to the power of uh, almost 10 to the power of 4 uh, watt per millimeter square. What is interesting here is the E beam process as you can see which has which can offer a variety of different power densities as well as hot spot sizes. So, that is the reason why E beam is preferred process for even things which welding cannot do or at a you know even like joining processes or cutting processes. So, E beam obviously is that way much much suitable process for drilling fine holes, cutting narrow slots, 
you know whatever can be done with welding arc or a gas flame can almost always be done with EB machining. So, holes with the diameter of about 25 to 125 microns can be drilled almost instantaneously in sheets of thicknesses up to 1.25 millimeters. This is the power of E-beam. A narrow slot which has been cut by EDM has a E-beam has a width of about 25 microns. Uh, we are talking about uh, an E-beam which would be very, very effective. I am not talking about soft resist processing here, but about metal processing mostly. So, here is where uh, it can go up to about 25 microns. Moreover, an electron beam uh, can be maneuvered and maneuvering can mostly take place because electrons uh, which are moving, fast moving, they face Lorentz forces through ambient magnetic fields. So, if you have magnetic deflection coils, uh, they are able to deflect and raster the beam typically over the surface. And so, you can actually go for machining very, very complex shapes and contours when we talk about such magnetically assisted electron beam movement. However, to avoid the collision of accelerating electrons with air molecules, you need to typically apply vacuum columns in which this electron beam processing can be done. So, uh, you know the, the work piece therefore, is quite limited uh, in its size which is limited by the vacuum column. It is very expensive to evacuate a column in fact and the vacuum levels we are talking about is about 10 to the power of minus 5 millimeters uh, of mercury. So, to indicate the, the wide range of applications of E-beam, uh, you know you, you can probably look at this power plot and decide for yourself that compared to the processes like electric discharge, laser beam machining, where we are wanting to place uh, electron beam really. In, in comparison to other for, for you know thermal processes, it really has a very, very wide range power density and hotspot diameters. So, let us look at how E-beam is produced and what is the basic principle of uh, generating uh, a fast moving electron beam. So, it is basically the thermionic effect and it starts with the hot, hot tungsten filament. So, you have a uh, hot emitting you know electron emitting hot tungsten gun or filament uh, which is the basis of uh, starting the electrons and then there are series of uh, either series or uh, you know series of perforated anodes you can say where uh, there is an acceleration quickly to the electrons and also there is some absorption uh, which, which is generated. So, this is a perforated anode here and then further there are electromagnetic lenses and uh, this controls the shape and size of the beam and also there are beam control lenses. So, once the size has been optimized and a certain diameter has been hit at or a focus has been hit at you could actually uh, raster this beam in a small zone okay, around by changing by deflecting the magnetic forces which are being applied in uh, these guns of both directions and so you could do beam rastering and this is really the work piece uh, which we are talking about. So, the beam is uh, shaped by a grid cup which makes sure that the beam actually you know is like uh, more like a self focusing beam as you can see here. So, these are the cathodes really. So, you can have uh, sort of deflection cathodes, so that you can actually have the beam uh, shape up into a small orifice. Um, so, in case of drilling holes, the hole diameter depends on the beam diameter and the energy density that you are uh, plugging in and this accelerating voltage here which really depends on the cathode anode difference of potential. Okay. So, this is the beam accelerating voltage. This is a very critical uh, component which determines what is the level of machining or what is the extent of machining that can happen the electron beam that has been produced. So, obviously, when the di diameter of the hole is larger than uh, the beam diameter, so the beam has to be uh, deflected in a circular path, so that the whole uh, radius can be uh, machined you know on the on the workpiece surface. So, most holes uh, drilled with an E-beam are characterized by a small crater on the beam incident site okay, of the workpiece and when such uh, uh, you know holes are continuously being drilled you have a through hole and you can have a E-beam drilling process. So, the drilled hole will also possess a short taper in this particular case particularly because of the fact that the beam also narrows down and there is something like a focus beam focus you know which is hit upon and that uh, is somewhere at the depth where up to which the cutting has to happen really. And so, for doing this 
uh, you always have this tendency of about 2 to 4 degree taper whenever you are using a sheet thickness more than about uh, 100 microns. Okay. So, anywhere above 100 microns you will definitely get a taper in the hole uh, that you are uh, trying to drill. So, these are some performance uh, parameters about the drilling uh, of holes uh, with different work pieces like for example, if you are drilling in tungsten, stainless steels, aluminum, alumina, quartz, you have different work piece thicknesses, hole diameters, drilling times, accelerating voltages and beam currents which are being given in this uh, uh, particular illustration, this table. So, you can see the very, very high accelerating voltages which have to be hit upon for, diam for, for drilling uh, not very high thicknesses in the range of 2.5 mm to 1 mm okay. and uh, you have excessively high drilling time which is in particularly stainless steel it is about 10 seconds for drilling about 2.5 mm workpiece thickness. So, if you compare it with the conventional drilling you can find out how much more energy will be consumed in drilling this, but obviously because such processes are meant for uh, extremely complex contours or shapes or even uh, to some extent the alloys which are otherwise hard to machine therefore, you can still consider EBM process although it is energy expensive in comparison to tungs uh, conventional processes. So, uh, material like alumina for example, which is very, very hard can be cut with a uh, higher drilling time. Okay. So, 0.75 mm work piece thickness is cut in about 30 seconds and uh, there you apply uh, almost a beam current of 60 and a accelerating voltage of uh, 125 kV which uh, makes it about how many uh, watts we can just check this. So, 125 times 10 to the power of 3 times of 60 times of 10 to the power of minus 6. So, this makes it makes about 7.5 watts of power. So, this is reasonably good power that you are using for cutting a small 0.75 mm or 750 microns thick uh, alumina work piece. So, that is how uh, you can characterize the various performance uh, uh, you know related parameters uh, with respect to the beam process. <laughs> While cutting a slot, the machining speeds normally depend on the rate of material removal. So, obviously, we have to have some parity between what is the rate of material removal, so that we can uh, fix up what is the beam scanning speed. Okay. So, this is more so important whenever we are doing uh, or processing on diameters which are much, much larger than the beam diameter, where it necessitates the beam to scan over the surface to remove the whole uh, material from the surface. So, uh, the sides of a slot in a, in a sheet with thickness up to 0 0.1 mm are almost uh, parallel and a 1 to 2 degree taper is observed in a slot cut with a thicker plate. So, anything above 100 micron as I had earlier told you had a almost always have a taper of 1 to 2 degrees. There is also a small amount of beam splatter which would occur uh, particularly on the uh, beam incident side and this may uh, result in some kind of a resolidification sometimes of the vaporized or molten material. Now, the tables uh, here give some idea about the slot cutting capabilities of uh, E-beam. For example, if I have a workpiece thickness of 0.175 millimeters and a slot width of about 100 micrometers, you know I would typically have at an accelerating voltage 130 or 50 beam current, 50 micro amperes uh, beam current, 130 kV is accelerating voltage, would have a cutting speed of about 50 millimeters per minute. Okay. So, it is not really a very, very big uh, speed of cutting uh, as far as the, uh, some of the other processes on the conventional side go. Similarly, for tungsten, brass, alumina, you can have various cutting speeds ranging from 125 millimeters per minute to about 50 uh, millimeter per minute for grass, uh, for brass and uh, for alumina it could be as high as about 600 millimeter per minute. Uh, obviously, these are corresponding to different thicknesses as you can see here the tungsten uh, plate that we are removing at a higher speed is about 0 0.05 uh, millimeters about 50 microns. Uh, similarly, or 5 microns I am sorry, uh, similarly uh, about 50 microns. Similarly, brass you know this is about 250 microns about 5 times thick than tungsten. So, what we are referring here is basically the range of cutting speeds that could be obtained for various thicknesses and various slot widths as can be seen with EV machining. 
So, uh, the other uh, small issue is about you know if there is some relationship that would happen between this beam power which I just calculated some time back uh, you know as about probably 7 or 8 watts power with respect to uh, maybe the material removal rate. And so, uh, such a correlation does exist empirically it has been found that uh, the power requirement is approximately uh, you know proportional to the rate of the material removal and uh, is basically represented as p equal to cq. This is only a very very first estimate you could say. Uh, I will actually show you a little different model uh, in some uh, in slides to come where we will be talking about uh, a slightly uh, more accurate version of this p equal to cq model. So, this is only a first estimate or a guesstimate you can say of the power. So, C is uh, sort of a proportionally constant which has been calculated for uh, different materials like tungsten iron, titanium aluminum and this is with respect to um, what is the power needed per unit material removal rate. The power is in watts and uh, you can see some of these values. Let us look at uh, a small example problem here. Let us say for we have to cut a uh, 150 micron wide slot using E-beam and we are cutting that on a 1 mm thickness uh, of a tungsten sheet okay. and a beam power of about 5 kilowatts is used in this particular case. We have to determine what is the speed of cutting. So, let the speed of cutting be V millimeters per minute and we need to calculate the material removal rate with V millimeters per minute speed. So, we are cutting a slot which is about 150 micrometer in width. So, this is the width of the slot and we are also cutting thickness of the sheet uh, equal to 1 mm. Okay. So, obviously, uh, if we looked at Q the material removal rate it will be the uh, thickness of the slot that we are cutting. Uh, you can multiply this with minus 3 to have the corresponding number of mm's. Okay. So, 150 microns or 150 into 10 to the power of minus 3 millimeters into 1 millimeter that is the sectional area times V millimeter per minute. Okay. So, this becomes so many mm cube per minute okay. and uh, the corresponding beam power therefore, uh, will be given by P equal to let us say C for tungsten material used is tungsten here which is being cut times of Q. So, the C for tungsten is borrowed as 12 watts per millimeter cube per minute uh, times of the number of millimeter cube per minute actually predicted through uh, the estimation in this earlier step here. So, since the P is given to be about 5000 watts that is how the beam power is V becomes equal to 5000 divided by 12 10 to the power or 12 into 0 0.15 millimeter per minute and so you can see here the uh, scan rate is really about 2778 millimeters per minute of about 4.6 you can say centimeters per second. So, that is how the beam scan rate can be. So, this speed uh, is only a guesstimate. Okay. And we will see in following modules that this is quite low than the actual speed. So, we will try to do some dimension analysis and we will try to see if we can uh, get an accurate version 
of the actual speed with all these different parameters like thermal conductivity of the workpiece or the beam temperature so on so forth which comes uh, or the melting point of the material so on so forth which comes uh, together you know in a, in a more consolidated and uh, analytical form. So, with this I would like to close this particular module and uh, uh, in the next module we will talk a little more about e-beam processing. Thank you and goodbye.